I think there's a couple different facets. I mean, ultimately, the heart of it is sin. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the issue, the issue is really complex because it's, um, it's a relationship. And, um, you know, enmity and division is the main fruit of the fall, right? So in, in the fall, man is separated from God, man is separated from creation, man is separated from other man, other men, man is separated within himself. There's, there's a fragmentation internally that happens. And so orthodoxy is the means by which those, those inner, first and foremost, the inner fragmentation is addressed and with God's help begins to become healed. And then from there, hopefully, as that inner fragmentation begins to heal, then the fragmentation between, you know, oneself and, and his or her family, you know, larger family, neighborhood, all those things. And I know that seems a bit kind of Pollyannish, but it's it's the reality of it because Slavery is the fruit of a idolatrous relationship. It's an it's the fruit of an idolatrous relationship, and and the problem that people have is they don't understand how qualitatively different the transatlantic slave trade is or was from the slavery of antiquity. People erroneously will employ various responses of the way that scripture speaks of slavery or the way that slavery has been um, found in every time period and nation. First of all, just because something's been found in every time period and nation doesn't mean that that thing is good in of itself. That's, that's the first thing. But the second thing is there's a qualitative difference between the, the transatlantic slave trade and the slavery that Paul talked about with Onesimus and, and such. Um, the one of the greatest damages and one of the most demonic facets of slavery and race in the American context is that not only the, does it reinforce and in many ways weaponize a very fallen kind of like fear of the unknown and the other but it in turn allows that projection to become internalized by those who are subjugated and so there is a, a nihilism there is a, a self-loathing that becomes internalized through the generations of habituation of behaviors that are the fruit of generations of subjugation and money can't fix that programs can't fix that um, only orientation right orientation to God can fix that and that's also why orthodoxy as opposed to just what we need is more religion or more God that's not what we need actually because in many african-american neighborhoods like in the neighborhood and the community that i serve you know others have others have remarked on this uh, especially in, in certain um certain sectors of christian hip-hop how you know when you go to the hood quote unquote you see lots of churches and lots of liquor stores you don't see that when you go outside i think there's a reason for that and one of the things that we struggle with is we, we, <laughs> one of the things that being an artist has taught me is that critique is good, actually. Critique is how you, and I think that's one of the things that orthodoxy shows you, as opposed to all other Christian traditions, really. For us, this idea of looking at oneself and that critique, that's one of the centers of our tradition. And it not only does it affirm that, but it says you must do it. And I think, you know, my my spiritual father in California who catechized me, he, he would always tell me, 
you know, orthodoxy is is perfect. It's when people cease to be orthodox that you you lose that perfection. And again, there's there's a lot of truth to that because what happens is is you know, fear is contagious. And when people fear the loss of something, other people pick up on that. And in the regards of race and so many misunderstandings of what it means to want to deal with it, fear kicks in. But healing and reconciliation has nothing to do necessarily with power dynamics and things like that. That's also a mistake. And it can be made on both sides. What it's about is being healed. When someone's healed, <clears throat> they become much less a self-conscious, anxious person. They become much more, not just at peace, but they become humble. Because they understand that the world doesn't revolve around them and the things that they are perceiving to be theirs. And the key word there is perception. And that's at the heart of a lot of race. Um, because race is a lens by which various passions are, are manifested. They become a symbol. And when you try to deconstruct that symbol, that's where people become really uncomfortable. But I think this is a, a bulwark of what Christ did in regards to deconstructing what, you know, the nation of Israel at the time was expecting out of the Messiah and all throughout our tradition, St. Basil, <laughs> the holy fool, you know, um, St. Zinia, you know, holy fools, they deconstruct these symbols that have kind of become idolatrous, right? And race is, is one of those things where people find themselves um, in this very idolatrous relationship with a caricature of themselves. And Christ, you know, the closer I draw to Christ, the more I become me. And myself and the world and, and the devils, all these, all these forces are trying to build up this false self. And Christ is, is coming in and tearing those things away. You know, it's, it's, in some regards, it is kind of like Eustace and the dragon, you know. There's, there are these scales that, that are built up. And culturally, nationally, we have these, these scales and these walls that we've built. And they're false. And I understand it's, it's a frightening thing. But on the other side of it is something, you know, beautiful. There's something beautiful. And the heart of it is the fear. And that fragmentation, you know. Did ears burn out those words? Did a voice whisper absurd? Did your mind comprehend and ask if you'd last till the end? Traded money and lands, family. 